Hello, everyone. Not too long ago, from a local service center where some good friends work, they brought me this marvel of ancient technology. It needed to be inspected, diagnosed, and repaired. I have repeatedly said that I am not a specialist in repairing inverters or any kind of equipment. I am a blogger enthusiast with some knowledge in Power Pulse technology, but sometimes I repair things for friends and family and sometimes purely for content. So, this is exactly the latter case. I will say right away that this repair will be for money, not for free, as I usually do. I will announce the cost at the end, and after watching the video and studying the prices of the parts, you can write in the comments how much you would charge for such a repair. Of course, the repair can be done as cheaply as possible, but it can also be done in a way that the device will last for many years. That is, to do a proper repair, with full maintenance. I am a perfectionist, so don't judge me harshly for any extra movements. Imagine that a repairman is like a doctor, and before operating on you, he must make the correct diagnosis. And to do that, a full examination is necessary. There's no other way. I'm saying this because any task should be approached with great responsibility. Any mistake you make as a professional could, in the worst case, lead to a major tragedy. But let's not dwell on the negative. Our device, as you understood, is a semi-automatic welder, quite old and very reliable. Its circuitry and overall design are classic, the so-called three-story type. It's not based on IGBT, but on MOSFET, meaning field effect transistors. It has been through a lot, meaning it's been thoroughly overhauled. The condition is terrible, tired, dirty, all scratched up, clearly hasn't been sitting idle. The complaint is that it turns on welds, but the current is insignificantly low and cannot be adjusted. I admit that I haven't turned it on, but to be honest, I highly doubt it ever turned on and welded. Its auxiliary power sources are clearly not working, at least one side of the bridge is blown. You'll see this for yourself a little later. A brief digression, why I called this inverter infernal. It's simple. Although it's assembled using a reliable topology, everything is implemented in a haphazard way. To put it back together, I spent a couple of hours even with several sets of tools at hand. I couldn't understand the logic of the designers. You always have to reach into some awkward spot to snap a connector in place. The power terminals and bolts, in general, are placed very inconveniently. And the color coding of the wires is mixed up. In one place red is positive. In another, it's negative. The control board was manually modified at the factory, with makeshift adjustments made by soldering some components on top of those already on the board. The soldering is terrible. At first, I thought it was the fault of previous repairmen, but this is from the factory. After a brief diagnosis, I realized there were problems not only with the transistors, but also with the auxiliary power supply and a bunch of minor issues like burnt small components, a faulty soft start system, and many signs of poor repairs. Then, after agreeing on the cost, the first thing I did was completely disassemble it. First, each of the boards was thoroughly washed with regular tap water. By the way, there are five boards. After washing, all the boards were dried on a thermal table for five hours at a temperature of 60 degrees Celsius. Yes, I could have just blown them dry and not bothered, but this way is better. I'm in no rush. Then I started the diagnosis and subsequent repair. I started with the simplest board. On it we have, you could say, just a large output choke wound with a copper bus and a few small components. A capacitor with a powerful 5 watt resistor at 47 ohms. The capacitor is blown. You can even see the crack. The resistor turned out to be completely functional. We replace the capacitor with a similar one, and that seems to be it for this board. Next is the power board with transformers. And output. Rectifier diodes. There are three transformers here, and theoretically they're all similar. First, we check all the diode assemblies. There are classic D9202 assemblies with a common cathode here. There are 12 of them. All rectifiers are functional. Afterwards, I checked the RC circuits, just in case, specifically the 22. Ohm resistors. There. All. Fine too. I know that in similar units, transformers don't often fail, 
but sometimes they do. The core can crack, or there can be an interturn short circuit. Therefore, I proceeded to check the inductance of all the transformer windings exclusively, and I can say they are within tolerance. Yes, there is a difference between them, but in the case of this particular transformer, all windings are equivalent. For the primary windings, it's more or less the same. The inductance ranges from 1900 to 2000 microhenries. Next, I examined the board for cold solder joints and ring cracks. I did find one spot, soldered it, and now this board is also fine. It can be set aside. The third board is our input section board with an input rectifier, a soft start system, and electrolytic capacitors for power supply. There are also some small components. It is evident that the thermistors, which limit the initial charging current of the input capacitors, were replaced on this board. Moreover, they installed whatever they had on hand. The board clearly indicates which thermistors should be used here, but in reality, the repairman put in different ones and soldered them terribly. I'm not trying to badmouth anyone, just so you know. Draw your own conclusions. I believe that if you've been paid, you should do everything with quality. Well, they could have asked for more money for quality repairs and not done such a sloppy job. I'm sure many people are willing to pay more if they were confident their equipment was in reliable hands. There's also a capacitor on this board that's clearly swollen. And it's not a deformation of the cap, it's actual swelling. The capacitors here are Nippon Chemicon 4 pieces at 470 microfarads, 450 volts. The input bridges, there are two of them on heat sinks, are rated at 25 amps, 1000 volts. The heat sinks were crooked, so I decided to straighten them and check the thermal paste at the same time. And, it's a good thing I did. The paste was clearly squeezed. Well, it's clear that it should be applied in a thin layer, but here the metal of the heat sink is visible under the paste. Also, from the imprint on the bridges, it's clear that the pressure was not quite even. We remove all the thermal paste, although I could have just refreshed it. Next, I pulled out all four capacitors and checked everything. The swollen capacitor is indeed swollen. Now everything is clearly visible. The others are basically fine. The internal resistance is not excessively high, and in terms of capacitance and leakage, everything is fine too. By the way, when I was pulling out the capacitors, I saw a clipped lead from some component, and judging by the glue marks, it was here from the factory. Greetings from the Chinese who assembled this inverter back in 2007. We put the capacitors back in place, and replaced the swollen one with a new one. Here we have Nippon Chemicon, and as always, the local sellers have a counterfeit. Here's the purchase capacitor, which is clearly smaller than the original ones and its capacity is only 380 microfarads instead of the promised 470. In the end, I installed a tested capacitor. This is a little-known Chinese brand, but it works quite well, and the capacity is more or less as expected. Additionally, we glue the capacitors to the board. This makes it more reliable. We remove this mess of thermistors. I wonder what the creator of this contraption was hoping for. In any case, his ideas didn't work out, and something blew up here. In general, we install new ones, the ones we need 47D15. Off camera, I checked all the new components, including relays and diode bridges. Everything works. All that's left is to apply KPT8 thermal paste on the bridge and attach the heat sinks. Everything is good with this board too. Let's set it aside as well. Next, we place the board with power transistors and the control system on the table for diagnostics. On this board, we see 12 MOSFET transistors. 2SK2837 with an isolation transformer and snubber circuits. Every three switches are connected in parallel. On this board, we need to check all the switches, gate limiting resistors, and powerful snubber resistors. During diagnostics, it became clear that one leg of the bridge is shorted. Since we have three switches in one leg, and the channel is precisely the one that's shorted, we need to dismantle all three. I found the culprit without any problems. Of course, it's preferable to replace all the switches, but there are 12 of them here, and it's quite costly, considering the prices from local vendors. I will be replacing all the switches in one leg, which means three of them. But that's at the end. For now, let's move on to other components on this board. There is a separate small board with an isolation transformer and gate circuits consisting of several resistors, diodes, and Zener diodes. Carefully dole to this board. Diagnostics show that there are no serious anomalies on it. 
As for the white and 1 N4148 diodes, I replaced them just in case, as there was a slight variance. It is also worth checking the integrity of all the secondary windings of this transformer, as well as the primary winding. Once you are sure everything is fine, the board can be soldered back in place. On this board, there is also a current transformer, whose secondary winding should be checked. Additionally, after this transformer, there is a rectifier installed on low-power diodes. We also check it. Now we prepare the mounting spots for installing new transistors and set this board aside for now, as we don't have the transistors at this stage. We move on to the next board, the most troublesome one, the control board. This board has been heavily modified, the auxiliary power source has been soldered and resoldered, traces are torn, several components are missing, and some resistors and diodes on the control board have either been resoldered or selected, it's unclear, overall. The soldering is in very poor condition. Upon close inspection, I found a lot of ring cracks. All of this needs to be restored to understand which components are missing in the standby circuit and why some resistors are in such a state, whether it's from the factory or someone's makeshift work. Honestly, I hate these kinds of repairs, and it's not about skill, like, a good technician should be able to fix everything and not complain. The question is about the amount of time spent. First, you need to find at least a similar schematic, compare all the nodes, restore the necessary components, and in the end, it might turn out that these solutions were factory made, and your inverter won't work as it should or won't work at all. And then you get caught up in it all, not noticing how you spent a couple of evenings just tinkering with the control board. Therefore, in such repairs, quoting, an exact repair cost in advance is somewhat incorrect. But then the client will misunderstand as well. To them, it doesn't matter that component level repair and simple board replacement are two different things, and the first one requires more time. I won't even comment on the process of restoring this board, as the previous technician apparently randomly replaced all the components of the auxiliary power supply. Apparently, they didn't understand the problem and forgot to put back a few components. The magic of editing and everything is ready. Oh, if only real life were that simple. By the way, regarding the restoration of this unit, I had a video on my second channel. For those interested, you can check the description. In general, the auxiliary power source has been restored, all questionable areas have been resoldered, and all that's left is to apply 310 volts of DC to the input of the source and check its operation. After all these procedures, the transistors arrived. We install them in their rightful place. Next, we clean the heatsink from thermal paste and also clean the thermal pads. Then we check them for any shorts. If everything is good, we assemble the inverter completely. The first startup must be done with input current limitation. Moreover, the current should be limited after the capacitive capacitors by connecting a 100 watt incandescent lamp in series between the capacitors and the inverter. Once you ensure there are no anomalies, proceed to testing. Unfortunately, I don't have carbon dioxide, so I won't be able to show a nice weld. Who cares about carbon dioxide? The welder isn't real either. We spray anti-stick aerosol into the torch and try it out. Checking the voltage adjustment of the device. It's currently set to minimum. Let's set it to maximum. Everything works. Checking the feed speed. All right, maximum. Everything works great. My task is completed. 
The inverter has been restored, fully serviced, and in the end, some areas on the boards were coated with lacquer in two or three layers. If I could also replace the sleeve and paint it, it would be practically a new device. By the way, another thing. I accidentally broke the plastic pressure washer, which is also the spool holder. At first, I wanted to glue it, but then I thought it would eventually break again. In the end, I just printed a new holder on a 3D printer, which is not as flimsy and thin-walled as the old one. This repair cost the owner $120 as of mid-October 2022. This includes the repair itself, the cost of parts, and full maintenance. I assure you, that's not much. If you, as a client, disagree with this, always remember, a cheap repair means no one will bother with your device. In five minutes, they'll replace a transistor without a second thought, without even disassembling the device, bring it to a working or semi-working state, and hand it back to you without any guarantees. That's roughly how it looks. And quality repair with full maintenance is the key to long and reliable operation of the device. No self-respecting technician will fuss over a device for cheap. It takes several hours just to disassemble and reassemble. And finally, let me remind you that I am not a repairman or a professional. I usually fix things for family and friends, and even then quite rarely. And I took on this device purely for content. Please do not contact me regarding repairs of any equipment, as I do not do that. This video is coming to an end. All necessary links can be found in the description. Wishing everyone peace and kindness. As always, this was Kazinov K. Until next time, goodbye.